On this week's show, how you can invest money into a property, pull it all out again, still own the property and make a profit. And in the news, how to turn an enormous, obsolete, unprofitable industrial space into an inspiring and versatile, thriving dream factory. And we're gonna be answering all your property related questions. Hi, I'm Russell Leeds. Hi, I'm Ben Mack. And welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. Ben, it is brilliant to have you on the show. Uh, just to introduce introduce you to Ben, uh, for you people that are re- with us regularly and are used to seeing myself and Alice there. So Ben works uh, with myself and Samuel and heads up all our property, in particular, property development deals. Yes. So when you've seen the castle, Ben's very hands-on, visiting there, managing there, our other development stuff that we're doing as well, you're really hands-on with. So Definitely. when it comes to sort of this subject we're talking about today, um, and, and especially the, especially the hands-on stuff, Ben is... 100%. 100%. Get hands dirty and get that money back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's why we make such a good team. Um, so, so yeah, so... Before, have you, have you, what have you been doing this week, property wise? This week, this week, property wise, I was about to say um, watching Arsenal lo- uh, almost lose to Leeds. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But property wise, I've been on the road this week, actually, Russell. Um, I, I was away from home for a couple of for a couple of days. I went to view some potential sites mm-hmm. uh, up north, pretty much doing a bit of a round robin, and ended up back in at Ripswood House, which obviously you'll know, and I'm sure some of your listeners will know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Is the castle our, our flagship project? Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And we're going to be we're going to be going out on the road again soon. Yes, we've got some investors who want to invest with us that we're we're taking out. Yeah, um, to go have a look around some projects. I'm excited about that. After this, we'll get planning on that. And we're, definitely, we're go definitely, with, really excited is, about that. Very cool. Okay, so brilliant. So our subject today, um, and I'll probably I'll probably ask you questions almost like interviews. Yeah, stuff, go that's ahead. Okay, so go ahead. let's say you're a well. First of all, is there much of a difference between a small development deal and a big development deal? What's what's the difference? Yeah, small. I mean, for me, I'm I'm generally used to dealing, or, or rather, I feel that the efforts and the rewards from the efforts that you make are from the larger deals. I would say going from seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds and above. Yeah. And the effort that it takes, maybe from a small deal in that sense, maybe from seven hundred and fifty k to multi million pounds. The process for due diligence is probably the same. The effort is probably the same, if you know what you're doing, of course. Um, so I would say the, the major difference is mainly just down to the numbers, but in terms, see, of, in terms of the workload, I, yeah, I would agree. Similar. I would say that, you know, because I mean, most of the people that, that we teach, because obviously we run a program on the academy mm. uh, called Infinite Returns, because yes. in essence, it, you put your money in, you get all your money back out again. Yep. Anything you make on top, it's an infinite return. Definitely. Because you haven't lost yep. any money, right? <laughs> 100%. So it's, um, and most of the people that, 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 that go through the program are focusing on much smaller houses. So I'll give you an example of uh, what I'm actually looking at personally myself at the moment. Okay. It's uh, property, it's, it's in the Midlands. It's going up for 60, 60 grand. Okay. But you can't get a mortgage right. because of structural damage. Mm-hmm. So I've had my builder go around, have a look around. He reckons he can fix the whole thing up, including fixing the structural damage for yes. about 15 to 20 grand. Do you know what? That's a good point because I think sometimes the banks might say no, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad house. Things can get fixed. Yeah. So yeah, you've done a good thing there. Now the other houses on the street are worth about 120 mm-hmm. because they're in a decent condition and they don't have structural damage, right? right? So for me, this is a very small, it's a very small deal. from. The sort of thing you're used to dealing with. Still a great 60 deal. Grand deal. <laughs> but it's still a great deal. I can put the money yeah. in. I reckon I'll pull all my money out and make about 10 grand and have the house. Right? So, yeah. it's, a, so it's, a pre- it's a pretty good deal. Definitely. But the effort involved in that, for, for me, is no different of a sort of shorter time period. Mm-hmm. But the effort is no different to one of the deals that we're doing we're looking at now, with yeah. you, right? Which Definitely. is much, much bigger scale, millions of pounds involved, but the yes. actual effort is the same. 100%. And, and the principles are the same. Would you agree with that? I agree with you. Okay, cool. Yeah. It just depends on how much money you've got and, how, and, and exactly. where you're at. Yeah. And, and and I suppose one thing that I know um, yourself and, and Samuel always talk about is having a, a good team around you and, and having, I suppose, a power team. That's critical, and it's even more so important when a lot more money is on the line, yeah. and it's a bigger deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so long as you do it properly, 
Yeah, it's just higher, a higher risk. More yeah. money is higher risk. Yes. More to lose. More yeah. to gain, more, more to, to lose. lose. Well, they say the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who's prepared to take financial risks for financial gain. gain. Exactly. So that's yeah. what we are, guys. And, and you manage the risk. Of course. You manage the risk. So, so let's, let's say then there's someone watching this and they're thinking, you yeah. know what, this sounds really great. You know, Ben <laughs> sounds amazing. How do I, where do I even look? For the, where, where would you look for these sorts for of the, For these sorts of opportunities. Now, for the, for the most profitable ones, it's always better to go off market, similar to what you would do again to, you know, with residential smaller projects, but off markets are, are generally better. And there's a bit of a, um, a, a say secret society. It's not necessarily that, it's more good relationships with estate agents who you trust, because once you eye up a property or a piece of land where you might be able to develop, I don't know, a, a hotel or a massive student accommodation scheme, if the word gets out that that's what you're looking to do, you guaranteed somebody with with much bigger financial backing will come and sniff it away from you. So um, definitely start with um, by looking at developing your relationship with agents, just networking and meeting people, um, and and seeing what's out there and approaching them under the radar if you like, and not particularly at the front end going going too crazy about it, I suppose. But. And same for smaller deals. So sixty yeah. grand houses is the same. Go and speak yeah. to agents. Get don't wait for them to go on right move. Definitely, definitely. There, there are some. Don't get me wrong. There are some profitable ones that are out there. They're on the market. You'll just pay a little bit more into it, and obviously that just takes away from your profit. So if you want to maximize your profit, try 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 stick to the off market stuff. It's always better. Well, this is one of one of the great things about deal sourcing because obviously mm. something else that we teach, and I say this to Alex Sarah all the time because he runs Better Sourced. Yes. Yeah. Because he's continually buying houses from from estate agents, yeah. not for himself, but he'll be buying way more than, than than me because he's passing. So he'll be buying I don't know like four a week, yeah, because uh, he's passing them he's on. Them. He's continually building the relationship with the estate agents, passing them on, and then yeah. they, they start coming to him before they even put them up. He's got a great model, yeah, and he's he's the type of person you definitely want on your side, <laughs> yeah, for sure, <laughs> because he's 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 got those relationships already built up, so you know. People like that are, are, are worth their weight in gold because the people that he's dealing with, sometimes it may not necessarily be that person he's got, but it's who that person then knows, particularly for the bigger for the bigger deals. Yeah. So yeah, Alistair is um, in a great position, he's, he's, he's and obviously yourself because you, again, you 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 work for companies, you've got a lot of contacts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So how does someone who's not a deal sourcer and mm-hmm. I mean, you might not know the answer to this, yeah. but how does someone who's not a deal sourcer, not uh-huh. worked for a com- for a quantity surveying company, not worked for a manager, how do, how do they, how do they get, in, get in? Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, do you know how do they I mean? get in? I, I think um, definitely networking, but most importantly, joint venturing with the right people in the right company. Okay. I think that's the, the safest way. You may not, the, the problem is I think, a lot of people try to be too greedy and, and they try to cut corners and cut people out who they shouldn't be cutting out. So JVing with people who know what they're doing, who are trustworthy yeah. um, and have got a clear plan, you know, and, and you, can, you can eke that type of information out just by meeting the person and, and going through and doing a DD with your solicitors, etc. But I say joint venturing is probably the best way to get, to, to get involved and start to learn things, particularly if you're talking about, you know, Hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of money, definitely. JV. And, and that and that could be, J, but JV, if you've got no money, yeah. Oh, if you've got no money, if you've got no money, if you've got, got money, no, if you've got no money, I say just deal sourcing. Yeah, that's probably the best way. Deal sourcing, learn sell it the on, crack, learn and get to your find commission. Deals, get yeah. in, make commission. Okay, yeah. that and, makes and, sense. and again, the bigger the project, the bigger the bigger the commission, right? Because if you're working on one percent, two percent commission, getting your hands dirty, isn't it? it definitely. If you want, if you, I mean, listen, if you've got money, it's it's a different thing. Yes. If you've got money, you can afford to sit back, you can give someone the money. You, like, you know, we get people come to us all the time who come and say, look, I've got 200, you, you'll know this. Yeah. I've got yeah. 250 grand exactly. I want to invest. You do this deal for me. Give me my exactly. 250 grand back plus, plus a percentage or whatever. 200 yeah. grand that you've made profit or whatever. Yes. Yeah, which happens all the time. 100%. For them, yeah. it's really easy. Yeah. But for someone that's not, you've got to get your yeah. hands you dirty. Have you've to, got to go in. You, you have to come around. out of your shell. You definitely yeah. have to come out of your shell and just give it a go because the worst that can happen is, is no. And I suppose the first thing is taking the action. So I, I met um, at, at one of your, your, your events, the DFE, a few months ago. I met one of your academy members who's absolutely doing so, so well. And it's obviously evident of the training that he's received. And now he's no longer looking at 
small like HMOs and things that he's looking at the you know the the big the, the big deals and he was keen to speak to me so so I, we went and sat down and I went through it and he's got a f- absolutely fantastic deal and the only thing that he said was I just don't know what to do with it so I gave him a helping hand and I'm, I'm working with him he's doing great but the, the bottom line is or the fact of the matter is he took he made the effort to find the deal and even when he thought I don't know what to do with it he made the effort to find someone who does know what to do with it mm. and he's going to, to benefit from that not just yeah. in experience, but also chiching in his money in his pocket. Well, so. we, we've had Academy members bring you deals. Yes, which yeah, you, which you but a few, yes. Yeah. So. And, and we've had others who, again, who are on the Academy, who've got a good amount of money, but they want to do the bigger, the bigger projects. Okay, brilliant. So, so step one yeah. is going to be get your hands dirty, go yes. out there, but if it's deal sourcing, meet agents, get in with people and tell them you're on the lookout for what? I think... If, if let's say we're starting small. I know yeah. that I know that you you do a lot of big. Yeah, so let's enough. say we're starting small. Yeah. It, if if you are deal sourcing, then you could look for as I suppose the lower end of the spectrum, shop units maybe which have got double double story. They they're easy conversions in terms of like commercial and scaling up to the bigger things. Or just um, horrible houses. Or just horrible. Yeah. Or just horrible houses. Or houses pubs, with pubs, issues. which seem to be a common things these days that a lot of people are doing. You know, to, to refurb and... Um, Houses with and issues, like, like structural damage. Houses with issues. No Perfect. one wants. Yeah, exactly. Then the things that nobody wants, exactly. And just make sure that you go with, for example, structural engineer who knows what they're talking about. And it's worth paying him, you know, yeah, two, yeah. 200, 500 quid or whatever he's going to charge you. It's worth paying him for his time to tell you whether to take the risk or not. Because if it works out... Or if it, to be fair, if it doesn't work out, it's only 200 quid, but it's probably saved you a <laughs> hell of a lot more money. Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, if it does work out, you've made you know, a massive profit. So well, look one, for things that people don't want as well. One of the things we were talking about the other day as well is obviously on, on a risk basis. Yes. I, I mean, we, we were talking, we were looking at a deal. I, I said to you, how, how, how risky is this, is this deal? And you said, well, and I thought it was a great answer. You said, well, it's not risky at all in one sense. In terms of, you're never going to lose the full money on it, but obviously there's, it depends. You need yes. to know when to quit. When to quit, exactly. Yeah. And I think a lot of a lot. So if we let's say you started the process, you're like, oh, this looks really good. Let's pay for the structural engineer. Let's pay for the service. Let's pay for this. Yeah. And then you, you know, sometimes, especially like people like me, who's a bit of an optimist and, and assume <laughs> stuff's going to work. I'm like, no, it'd be fine. It'd be great. It'd be, and and then someone like you would like, no, no, no. At, at this point, at this point, we pull <laughs> out. Ah, like, yeah. oh, but then we've lost ten grand <laughs> for nothing. You know, it's like, no, no, no. We, we it's not worth the yeah, risk true. of the rest. So, but yeah. so. It's knowing as well when you get started in it, like you say, pay for the structural engineer. Yeah. And if they're like, mm, it's risky, don't think, ah, it'll be fine, and put more money in and more money in. Exactly. You know, quite a lot of the time when you, when you watch a show like Dragon's Den, yes. you'll see people that go on to Dragon's Den, they've got a business model, and the dragons are like, oh, I feel really sorry for them because they, he should have quit five years ago <laughs> he's carried on putting his life savings life savings Same. life savings life savings he's now got nothing and then, and then it makes it the more you the you further put, you go you on the harder it is to go back so, yeah, yeah. so most people you know it's very commonly said don't quit you know, I'm not a quitter don't I'm quit not, but actually <laughs> you have to know and, you have to know when to quit <laughs> to know, and, and, this, and it's not necessarily um, quitting it's not an L it's not a loss because that only gives you the experience to then analyse the next deal so that just means when you go into the next deal, you're going to go in with eyes wide open. You know what to look out for. So a good example, and you won't know this yet because I haven't updated you, but on oh, one of the God. projects we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> How much have we lost now? No, no, we haven't lost anything. We haven't lost anything. But um, again, when we're talking about de-risking, so when you first look at a project, the you, first thing you think about is what's the biggest risk? Um, is there a little river around the back? similar to this one that I'm about to tell you about. <laughs> is there a little river around the back? Is there a potential problem? And for example, on that particular deal, when I looked at it and I analyzed it, I had a quick drive by, I didn't see there was a little brook around the back. But having gone to look at it again and met the vendor and, and done my searches and, and, and DD, I found there is a little brook, but it's then knowing, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna present a problem, but how do you overcome that problem? And if it's too insurmountable and if it's too costly, then you just walk away. You haven't lost anything apart mm. from a drive up to you know Midlands or whatever. Um, but the likelihood is there's always a way around it because we're not the first people to be building and fixing houses and and big and building big buildings. There's always a way around it. It just might cost a bit more and it eat into your profit. But yeah. ultimately, 
it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Cool. Okay, so let's go through. So step one is you you surround yourself with the right people. You get in the know. You tell them what you're looking for, which is which is crappy houses. Yeah. Or or, or areas that, Things you, that you know you nobody wants. So land, for example, would fit yes. the bill. We've got one. We'll maybe talk about it in a bit. We've got some land. We build. And I think Samuel's documented it to a degree actually. But you're yeah. managing that. How, is it six houses? Isn't it six houses? Um, and they're due to finish end of March. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So you've got so potential opportunities for. I would say you're looking for houses or areas where you can add value to it. Definitely. Yeah, and pe- places Definitely. that people don't want. Yeah. And like you say, off market's even better. So that's the first thing that you do. The second thing that you do is you then do your due diligence. De risk it. Do as not much skimp. As Pay the pros. <laughs> do what they need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which exactly. in some ways makes it easier because, you know, if you if you know nothing. I mean, it is better to know, but if you know nothing, you're going to pay the pros. If you're a bit of a handyman, you might think, <laughs> you, you might think, oh, I kind of, oh, that'll be, it'll be all right a bit, and then, no. Okay, so you need to, for sure, need to check that. Yeah. Um, so then, step three, you've you found the house, you've done your, you've done your check. Yes. Okay, brilliant. I, I'm, I'm confident now. I've got my quote from my builder. He's checked it all out. Mm-hmm. What do I do now? Go for the builders. Right. After, after that, you need to work out how much it's going to be worth. Because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Well, I suppose actually you probably should have done that at the beginning. Yeah, that's part of you. You, you might. I'm assuming you probably have an idea. Otherwise, you <laughs> probably haven't even gone that far yet. Yeah. Um, and depending on how you're doing it, if you're doing it cash, then it's easy because you you you've kind of got an idea. You've probably spoken to an agent. Um, you've got an idea of the cost. But if you're borrowing, you then need to get the appropriate paid market type research. Yeah. <laughs> to substantiate if you're borrowing money for it um, to, to fix it or build it up because um, the bridging company won't just take your word for it will they no they won't, they, you, no, you can't no. just turn around and say well I looked on right move and the other houses in the street were yeah. 120 so it's 120 and, and sometimes even speaking to an agent doesn't constitute to be enough information for well, we found that <laughs> we, 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 we have yeah we have yeah. so it's, again it's just a lesson in some of the step um, and sometimes you, you might need something more to add more meat to the to the initial valuation, yeah, and yeah. and just to give them the confidence that they're going to get paid, and you know what you're doing, and and I think that's probably the next step. And then I suppose after that is getting on and doing doing. A, well, you need you need you need your, obviously your broker who you'll speak your to broker. and we'll get you sorted out with your finance, finance and then just yeah. just do, do it. it. Yeah, and so, when you do it, I'd say my advice would be do it properly again. You've really not skipped any skip steps or scripts. You know, you've paid who needs to be paid. Do it properly. Get your contracts in place. I've seen this time and time again where a lot of things are just done on the back of a fag packet type agreement. Handshake, oh, it'll be 50 grand to fix this thing or 100 grand. Um, yeah, just do it and we'll pay you. And there's no real structure to it. There's, apart from a handshake... It's very, very loose. And if things go wrong, which they do a lot in, in, in construction and property, yeah. um, and it, things just get messy when they don't need to be, just just put a contract in place. It protects the, the builder. It protects the, um, the owner of the property. A, and Simple. a contract with penalties if they don't finish yeah. on time. On time, yeah, especially that. Because a lot of it's quite loose. What, what you don't want is, like for example, you're doing your, your, your project that you're looking at now, and when they start looking at that, and for one reason or another, they get another job, which happens often. <laughs> they get another job somewhere else down the road, and it's paying them more money. They'll park your site. They'll park your project. <laughs> yeah, especially if they, get, if, they get, <laughs> if they get one that comes up and they say, like, um, you've got a dead... If you will give you the work, but you've got to stick to this deadline, they'll yeah. just scrap you off. They'll just scrap you off. Yeah, exactly. So depending on the levels of, of, of costs, obviously, the, the bigger the, the, the value project the higher the penalties and, and, and the more, I suppose, security or protection there is. Um, but you can equally just apply the same principles to the, to the small, to smaller refurbs and, and I guess the, the, the brrrs, if yeah. you like. Yeah, same yeah. principles, still still applies. What would you say to someone then um, who'd found a house, yep. they'd found the end value, uh-huh. um, they'd got the builder's quote, which they got in a contract, Yep but they were just crapping themselves to actually do it in case something went wrong and, and, and they didn't have the, the balls to go for it. Yeah. Pay a PM. I get, I get, <laughs> you pay, pay a PM. Pay a PM to do it. It might cost you some money, but at least it's getting done, I suppose. And, and likewise, if you're a busy professional, like you're really busy. Yeah. You know, um, and with the, with the amount of houses that you and Samuel are buying, I, I, 
I definitely know you've got a power team because you're not out the office all the time. You're, you know, you're here, yeah. you know, you're here making this content for people to to learn and and to be better. Um, and it's just power team again. A, a project manager is definitely part of your power team or a builder you can trust at least. Yeah, and, but what yeah. about if even if the builder does a great job? What about if the, if he gets downvalued or you know? Oh, I guess yeah, the, where, yeah. exits. I guess exits. You have to have your exit strategies in place. So. Before you even probably this is probably part of the DD. <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to figure out number one, I suppose, when you'll pull out and have that as you know set in stone. Sometimes it's tempting to stay in if you've got some money in in, in a deal. Um, you have to know when to pull out, and you have to have your exit strategies definitely in place. And I've heard you, Samuel Alistair, always talking about that, and it's just the same on the big projects. Um, if it's downvalued, sometimes you have to be prepared to hold it and perhaps maybe rent it out. So make sure that when you're analyzing your deals, et cetera, you've, you've got that in the back of your mind and you have to make sure that you're not gonna be upset <laughs> with that outcome if you do have to hold it for a few months. Yeah, we'll make yeah. sure that if it does get down valued, you're not screwed. Yes. It's, it's got the best case, worst case, likely case. Yeah, exactly. Best case is I'm gonna, like the deal I was just talking about now, best case is I'm going to make 10 grand profit, yep. have 25% equity in the house, and yep. get all my money back out. Exactly. Worst yeah. case is I'll leave some money in the property. Yeah. Does that matter to me? Not really. Probably not, yeah. Uh, okay, one of those things. Whereas yeah. if it was worst case is I can't refinance it because it's gonna get downvalued, I won't be able to pay the bridging company back, I'll go bankrupt, <laughs> it's true though. Yeah, it's it true. Happen, happens. Right? It happens. It happens. Yeah, it does happen. Yeah. And although, and, and I like, this is a good point. You, you mentioned this to me the other day is um, the bridging companies and development finances, they're almost a, a second pair of eyes yeah. because they won't lend to you if they think there's not enough money in the deal um, for it to go wrong. So as a matter of principle on, again, we've got, we're doing a lot of deals, Russell. I'm just thinking about all the ones I've been, I've been looking at. <laughs> um, on the one that I've been looking, focusing on, that that I've been going round, round up and down the M M one and M forty four, um, the development finance guys, they just said, listen, we won't give you any money unless you're making a minimum of twenty five percent, and the reason they say that is to protect themselves. They know if anything goes wrong, there's still enough fat in there to keep you interested as a developer, and the likelihood is there's still enough in there to pay us back. That's all they they're worried about. So just make sure you've got a good return on investment on whatever you're doing and making a good margin. Brilliant, so re margin. let me just let me just recap this in my yeah, head. Uh, okay, ahead. so you wanna get into development finance. First thing you need to do is you need to get your hands dirty, to get around estate agents, start looking for off-market deals, start looking for deals where you can add value. So a deal where, where perhaps it, it, you could build on it or where there's, you know, it's, it's a horrible state or needs structural repair, but something you can add value to. Yeah. Uh, then do your due diligence. Get your structural engineers out. Get yeah. a proper builder's quote. Get a contract in place. Yeah. Um, and have a look what the end value is. Get a surveyor to go and have a look and 100%. say, this will be the end value. So you, so it's worth X. You need to know the first figure. What are you going to pay for it now? Yep. The builder is going to charge you Y. Yep. And exactly. it's going to be worth C at the end, whatever it is. You need to know those three figures and then you just need to go for it. That's it, 100%. And um, I was just thinking just then as you were speaking, in terms of somebody who's starting with little or no money. One thing that people are afraid of doing is getting involved in the planning process. Now, if you know what you're doing or if you get educated or, or get handheld through or coached through a process, if you found a piece of land and you think, oh, I don't have enough money to build that, perhaps maybe don't think of building it. Perhaps maybe think of securing it and getting planning for it and then selling that on to someone else and you've added value it adds sometimes it adds millions of value to a site yeah, yeah, yeah. and at times if you don't have any money to buy perhaps maybe as a gem just to, that i'll give you there is maybe speak to the owner of the land as you would do maybe a house and just say listen i've seen your your piece of land here i think this could be built on it if i could get planning on it and get it sold for x amount well would you be interested um in letting us do that and then I'll pay you for the land through the sale of whatever. And you've again, you've added value. That's mm. the added value. So we're starting with little to no money. Don't think, I don't have money, I can't do anything. There are plenty of things you can do. Yeah, just, well, just we, we've got one right now, which is yeah. kind of like a lease option. Yeah. I, I, you know, 
uh, a, a deal that we've got. But on, so we've got this property, and we said, look, we won't pay you now for it. Yes. But what we'll do is we'll take control of it. 100%. We'll use full development finance to do it up. Yep. We'll then remortgage it. Yep. We'll give the development finance back, and out of the profits, we'll pay you the money that it is now, and then we take the rest of it. It literally is a no money no, down deal. Exactly. Infinite returns. 100%. And you're getting paid at the back end, a good number. <laughs> so, it is, it is a good so, number. so it works. It works well. So there's 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 plenty of ways around it. You just have to think outside the box a little bit sometimes. Don't let. Um, sometimes even the professionals that you employ will tell you it's not a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so very true. you have to be prepared, you know, for all sorts of outcomes and just um, get educated. Know what you're doing. Get confident. Get your hands dirty and and just do it. Amazing. Do it. It's now time for this. Okay, so in the news this week, and kind of linked actually, you were telling me, uh, in fact, tell me again, and then... You know, yeah, we'll sure. So, there's a, a, I suppose, a thing that's going to be trending very, very soon, because throughout Europe and in England, the amount of warehouses that were purpose-built for a certain type of use, and that function is no longer being done. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the factories are just being, are just sat there. So, like, like, like books, for example. Sorry? Books. Which, which was that one? I mean, well, books. Oh, book, know, oh sorry, book. book. Oh, of course, sorry, yeah, books. Because like, of digital, sorry. That's all right. Well, well, number one, number one, digital. Yeah. Because obviously everyone listens to Audible. But number two, they print them to order, like Amazon. Yeah. Just print a book. So you order a book, they don't store them. They just press a button, it prints it, it prints and then they send it off. And gone. So they don't need the storage that they, that they exactly, used to have. Exactly, yeah. So there's, there's a massive surplus. You just hit the nail on the head there. There's a massive surplus of like um, industrial units. Um, that were purpose built. Now, for example, like Amazon, you just touched on there, they build their own units to suit. But who's to say in 30, 40, 50, 60 years' time that they'll need those units? You know, and yeah. that's what's happened with the old industrial um, type warehouses. And someone, someone in, in Amsterdam thought of a very, very clever idea to convert them into um, new office spaces, like refreshed. It's not just your usual stood partitions painted walls it's all just exposed services you've got the concrete floor on yeah, yeah, yeah. The- it's really like oh you showed me some pictures it's like really urban really cool yeah, but, but also lovely. really spacious very spacious you can see all the industrial stuff but then they've got like a couple of different floors loads of space they've got like really quirky it's an awesome modern. concept it is really really cool and I haven't really seen it um, well there's only two places that have been referenced in this article and one's in New York and this one's in Amsterdam. Yeah. And when I saw it um, this, this last week, I was thinking, this would be great for us to do. <laughs> it gave me yeah, an idea. Yeah. I was thinking, I think we could do this. Um, I'm not sure how much sort of like it would cost yet, but I could probably work it out relatively quickly if, if, I, if I had some drawings to work it on. It doesn't look expensive, though. It doesn't look expensive. Because it it's the same expensive. shell and the, and the same it's, interior, really. Yeah. It's just and all, the yeah. fixtures. And- all they're doing is on the outside, put some nice facade cladding on there, make it look attractive. But the and they're doing it. They're self. doing it as uh, like serviced offices. So serviced you pay for office. space. Yes. Which is like serviced accommodation, but but for offices. Yeah. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. And and you can make a lot more money than than. I think it's a great way to because I'm sure you can secure a, a, an industrial unit for some good prices, particularly if it's been derelict or just been stood for for ages. Yeah, so and if you do I it in a good area a like London, like if you don't yeah, well, it's like, populous. Yeah, if you don't like Creative. somewhere in the I don't know, like somewhere on the east east of London, there's a lot of uh, I don't know. Create yeah, because I think there's a, there's a lot of a lot of these startup um, companies are like creative agencies, art, you know, for, for photography. Um, well, so many studios. small businesses there's so many things nowadays. You can do. So many small businesses. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Well, and there not, you go. We, well, this is literally Ben brought. The, he showed me the news article, and I was like, let's talk about it on the podcast because that <laughs> is like cool, doesn't it? I'd, I'd love yeah. to, if anyone does anything like that. I would love it's to see it. Yeah, for and sure. It would be amazing. So. Well, Albert would just go to pop on a plane and go to Amsterdam. It's only like 40 quid, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to Amsterdam in how long? What day are we on today? In two weeks. In four weeks. Yeah, I'll see if I can dig up the info. And so if, I might go. Yeah, if, if, if it's around, just go have a pop in. It looks, it looks quite good from the pictures. I think it it's does. an awesome idea, that. It does. I'll take some pictures and show if I, if I get a chance. Yeah. If, I do, if, I get, if it's nearby where I'm going, yeah. I will go. Yeah, that'll be look. great. That'll be great. Brilliant. Right, it's now time for this. <coughs> a 
Okay, so it's the Q&A part of the podcast now, so we're very lucky as we've got Ben here to help answering the questions. Yeah. Um, so the first question, actually very, very relevant to what we've talked about, mm. is from Kieran Horton, uh, and he's posted this, by the way, on the Property Investors with Samuel Leeds Facebook group, and he said, how do you work out the done-up value? How do you work out the end value? Um, well, obviously, the, the best way, is what you mentioned earlier, yeah. is to pay. A valuer value to, to, come, to come and work exactly. and work it out, yeah. but you don't want to be paying valuers willy nilly left, right, and centre. All the time. So how do you get a rough idea? Well, for me, and again on smaller stuff, you'll probably have a different answer for the for the bigger stuff, mm. which is more complex. But for smaller stuff, that like the house I was talking about earlier, I just look at the street that and look at the hundred percent yeah. and look at the sold prices, mm. not the not the asking prices. You can go on right move. You look at the sold prices. Very different thing to asking price. Have a look through. Look at the last couple of years, assuming the market stays pretty similar, and yeah. just see. Okay, that house looked pretty much the same. It sold for and 120. You know You're spot on with that. Because ironically, um, when I've spoken to agents and then sort of <clears throat> agents just doing a rough market appraisal on their letterhead for like bridging or development finance, the information that they use is from Rightmove. <laughs> and all they do is they just go, obviously, on, at a, in a radius around, yeah. and they just put little costs of the houses around dotted yeah, lines. So yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a proven formula. It works. And just have a look. Okay, works, that looks yeah. similar. Oh, that looks a bit better, actually. So mm -hmm. this probably a bit less. Or ass is better than that one. So, <laughs> probably, you know, just getting a rough idea. Have a look yes. at a few and see what it's going for. Uh, next question. How do you do Rent to SA due diligence? How do you know if an area is saturated? And where or how would you go to find the occupancy rate to know if your property would work? This is from... Um, this is from Mardichi. 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 How do you pronounce that? You've got a very strange surname. So. Oh man, you know what? Uh, yeah, dude. His surname is Machakanyanga. Machakanyanga. That will be a spelling test at the end of the that's podcast. Why <laughs> <laughs> that's why we yeah. all call him Ben. Mac. <laughs> <laughs> um, copy and paste that. <laughs> ben Machakanyanga. Yeah. So how how do how would you check? I think. Was well, a few you ways. Know, if, yeah. I think if you go on to um, like Airbnb, I suppose, and type in similar locations. You can get a vibe of Airbnb, you can use AirDNA, you can use Booking.com, oh, yeah. you can use all, all those sites to have a look and you see what's getting booked. Value is. Um, you know, AirDNA in particular is pretty good. But again, you, you can, if you, how hands on do you want to get? Do you want to go in the area? Mm. Try and find as letting agents, people like pass the property, and there's lots of agents like that that will yeah. do an area. You can say, hey, look, this is, would you take it in this area? What do you think of the area? Speak to agents, speak to hotels. What's the occupancy rate in those areas? Try and get a vibe for how saturated it is. It involves, a, there's not a, a just a, yes, that area is good, that area is not. You've got to go and put the work in. Exactly. Um, Make some where, phone calls. And yeah, so that, I hope that, hope that kind of answers. I mean, obviously, I know it's very brief, but I hope that kind of answers your, your question. Um, next question, you can answer this one, uh, Ben. This is from Fran Miranda. Yeah. And she says this, where do I start? Where do I start? Where I do think I start I've from? got an answer for you. It all starts at the crash course. Boom. It all <laughs> yeah. starts. I'll, you tell you, I'll tell you what, what's, what's funny. I've, I've always thought about this. Now, I've known you and Russell for a long, you and Samuel for a long time. And... Everything that you guys teach through the academy and everything, uh, some of it, it's, it sets you up even for the bigger projects yeah. and development. Same principles apply, guys. You start the crash course. Great insight. Brilliant. You get some awesome there you go. insight for Hope free. Hope I answered your question. Yeah. For, it's free. It's free. It's Two free. days for yeah. free. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously you can go on to do further training, but you do not have to. A lot yeah. of people don't. That's, that's fine. Uh, next question is from Edwin Lee. Um, again, you can answer this if you want. Uh, I earn a proper... I, Earn a property. I assume it means own. I own a property outright, but I can't get a mortgage yet because I just started a business. What can I do? JV with your mom. <laughs> there you go. It's not an insult. Mom, dads, family members, do it. I would. Uh, you could do that. I, or, or the other thing that you could do, do is ring around lots of different brokers. Just be honest with them. Explain your situation and see what yeah. see what they yeah, can come true. up with. They, they, it's funny what they'll, they'll the, the solutions they'll give you, aren't they? The brokers. Yeah, yeah, they know yeah. so many ways around things. And, and if one says no, don't give up. Try another and yeah. another and another and see. And, you know, and see so, so I know so many people that have said they can't get a mortgage. Yeah. And then they, I say, well, go speak to another broker. Go speak to another broker. <laughs> That's true. And, yeah, then, yeah, and they go, oh, I got one. <laughs> I told you. I told you. Um, let's let's uh, let's do let's do one last one. Hi Russell, hope you're doing well. I had a good Christmas and New Year. I'm struggling at the minute to get rent to rent leads. I've contacted landlords via Daft. 
i.e. the Irish version of right wing movement, but seemed to be struggling to get results and ideas. Anything would be appreciated from Emmet. Uh, hey, Emmet, I hope you're well. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is, is, is for rent to rent, particularly when you're first starting, it's a lot easier to go direct to the to the, vet, to the to the vendor, direct to the landlord themselves, rather than going through an agent. So I don't know what they've got in Ireland, um, but similar websites to things like Gumtree, oh, yeah, um, you know, places where where landlords put their property to rent direct, you can get in front, uh, to them direct. Is the best place to go. Explain what you're doing, um, and just be really honest. With them. I actually did a little video on YouTube of me ringing an agent, explaining what rent to rent. Was, sorry, not an agent, a landlord. Explaining what rent to rent was on Samuel's YouTube channel. You can probably go and find it and check it out. Um, and it's just showing how you go through the call, uh, how, the best way to word it and whatnot when you're speaking to these landlords. But yeah, basically go direct to the vendor. Go to the landlord direct. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Well, Ben, absolute pleasure having you on the show. No problem. Thank you so much for watching at home uh, or listening at home. Don't forget to tune in next Saturday at 7 p.m. We'll be back every single week. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please do share, comment, share it with your friends, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.